is a presentation of the iRacing Esports Network. After a round six event that was marred by off-track slowdown penalties galore, with the woes of Canada behind, we move to the land of the rising sun. From Tsukuba Circuit and presented by Rikmotech, it's round seven of the Advanced Mazda Cup's 2019 winter season. With five different winners over six races, today's outcome is anything but predictable. See all the action unfold like a poorly made origami swan live as it happens right here on the Global Sim Racing Channel via the iRacing Esports Network. Konnichiwa everyone and welcome to another GSRC broadcast streaming your way on IESN. Joe Peak joins yours truly Bill Soups on to bring you our words eye view. Sean Ambrose as director duties armed with cameras locked and loaded by Dougie Beard. Joe, many times these little Mazdas seem undersized and not a good fit for some of the bigger racetracks offered by iRacing. For me, if an NX5 was Cinderella's foot, then Sakuba's circuit is the glass slipper. Tell us a little bit about today's racetrack. Well, and I doubt we'll see any drivers late to the ball for this week's race. This has quickly proven a popular track on iRacing, which should come as no surprise. It's shown up in other racing sims for years now, so most drivers were already pretty familiar with it by the time it came to the service. Add to that that this is now part of the base content here on iRacing, and you can expect free cars like the Miata to turn up in troves. But there's a problem with big fields here. It's a mere 1.2 miles long, which comes out to a hair over two kilometers. There's little in the way of long straights, and despite the presence of three hairpins among its 12 turns, passing opportunities come few and far between. Expect qualifying to be a big decider in the finishing order, and if any of the faster drivers have a slip-up, they might get frustrated quickly being stuck behind a slower car. But we've got a Japanese car on a Japanese track, so I'm with you. There's few more fitting combinations on iRacing. In fact, let's jump on board the GSRC lap guide to see exactly what it's like to drive around here. All right, we've got Johan Vandenbelt and the GSRC MX-5, so let's do a lap around Sakuba. Down to turn one, this is likely going to be the best place to make a pass. Everywhere else has its downsides and requires big mistakes to make work. With this being a hairpin, you'll want to square off the exit, and that brings us through the weaving bit of three and four. It forces you into something of an awkward entry into five, which is why, despite being a hairpin, it's really tough to execute an overtake here. There's lots of banking, so use that to your advantage. Immediately, you've got to switch sides to set up for seven. This corner looks simple from the outside of the car, but it tends to be deceptively tough to nail, as well as carry your speed through. Eight and nine are simple, flat-out kinks that you sort of round out to make one long turn. And then you hit 11. This last hairpin is unique in the way it's tighter on entry and then slowly opens up on the exit. It makes getting the power down as soon as possible one of the more critical aspects of this track. And while it does dump you onto the longest acceleration zone down towards turn 12, it really doesn't offer you a good passing opportunity. There's very little braking into this turn because of how fast and long it is. Ideally, you want to set yourself up to get a better run onto the front stretch so that you can go on the attack back into the first corner. But hopefully you've now finished a lap around Sakuba. That video lap, as well as everything on this broadcast, is sponsored by Reekmotech. The most complete source for all sim racing hardware, they have it all. From starter kits and do-it-yourself plans to professional level gear and complete motion simulators. They can fabricate adapters, modification kits, and high-end hardware in addition to carrying a complete line of specialty products from major brands. See it all at Reekmotech.com. Bill? Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the point standings. Now keep in mind that these points take into account the two of four drop races allowed for in the rules. To put it simply, 
it's each driver's four best four of six results. Now, Robert Hartley won the first two races and has been at the top of the chart all season long, but as drop races slow his point total, the rest of the field begins to close the gap, the biggest closer being Travis Swinky. Coming off a round six win, Dory has moved within 89 points of the leader. Surprisingly, Dries Nice is not among the five winners this season. Nevertheless, the Belgian driver is only two points back of second. The hamster, Mike Dam, has a win and sits in, what would that be, third, fourth position. And his fellow Maple Leafer, David Paton, is well back rounding out the graphic. All right, Joe, let's talk about the event details. Absolutely. We are in round seven here. So we're now into the second half of the season. And there you see those four drop weeks marked by the four droplets. Now, uh, today's race is going to be made even more frustrating by the fact that it's only 25 minutes long. So it's one of their sprint races uh, with a place that lacks passing zones. Uh, so you can expect maybe a few errors being made by drivers getting desperate to make overtakes. The setups on these cars are open in the advanced Mazda Cup, but there's not a whole lot that you can do to the Mazda. It's a pretty basic car, uh, so don't expect too much speed to be found in drivers doing that. They have an incident cap of 17, uh, and I don't think that should be too much of a problem around here today. They are disqualified, however, if they hit that 17 incident limit. And there you see the points are decided by the official points uh, that they garner in iRacing itself here today. Bill, they also have no spare car. And well, this is a tight little track, Bill. That could actually come into play if drivers find themselves running off into the barriers. Absolutely. I am really excited to do a broadcast here. These cars are a good fit. We've talked about it so far in the opening a few times. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at the weather before we get to look at the qualifying. Yep. Uh, right now we've got uh, 83 degrees track temperature. It's late in the day here right now. It uh, looks like about uh, 3.30 in the afternoon in January. So these drivers, uh, uh, of course, seen early sunsets here in the middle of the winter. Uh, so good conditions, not too much wind. These cars can sometimes be susceptible a little bit to the wind and a little bit of humidity. Basically, uh, these drivers have it pretty good uh, other than the passing conditions, Bill. So uh, I'd say expect to see some relatively fast times here in qualifying. Talk about fast times and qualifying on big tracks that are draft uh, dependent. You know, qualifying, not that big a deal. That's not the case here today. You want to get a good time. And up front, it's our point leader, Robert Hartley. But right behind him is the Kiwi, Gene Fittis. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm noticing that I think we're getting a couple drivers that don't usually come in here. I don't remember Hironori Kobayashi, who sits in eighth, uh, having shown up. I kind of figured maybe a track like this would, would maybe get uh, a few quote-unquote local drivers showing up. Absolutely. You would think a little home cooking going on. Also, Otto Flitzler in, in seventh position is a name I'm not familiar with as we have... Hey, Gene Fittis gets up to the pole. Nope, I'm sorry. Nope, it's still sorry. Robert Hartley didn't mean to, didn't mean to get you excited, all you uh, Kiwis out there. <laughs> Travis uh, Wallace does move up into third, though. Nope. Yeah, absolutely, and he's still got a lap to go. He's on a 102.3. Now expect to see relatively tight times here, uh, which I do see at least uh, between Wallace, uh, Balouf, uh, and uh, Balufe, and and Baton. But it's three tenths between Hartley and Fittis. That's that's a big gap on a short track like this, Bill. Indeed, it is. Short track in a fairly large field of 25. Is I think we had 50 drivers in the those and half those splits. See what Wallace has up his sleeve. This, I think, is one of the trickier corners, this, this turn 12 here, because you really need a late apex. You can see him taking it right here and doesn't quite get down to it, but I don't think he'll suffer too much. Let's see as he crosses the line. Well, he does improve, but it's only by a few hundreds. But that corner is going to make a big difference because it leads to one of the few places where you've got kind of a decent passing opportunity, and that's down into turn one, Bill. So really making sure that you get a run off the corner is going to make or break things. We have no Japanese names for these corners. The first right and the first 180, they call it one and two. Then you go through the S's, that's three and four. Then you get down to the left-hander 180, that's five and six. Then, of course... Uh, 
turn seven is that uh, probably one of the more basic corners, uh, a 90 degree yeah. right hander. But the thing about that one, Bill, I found is uh, it's not as tricky in this car, but in a lot of vehicles, I found it's tough to get the most speed out of it. For this Miata, it's mostly just a lift, but you can still overshoot it if you get greedy. And uh, drivers could lose it or get a slowdown penalty if they just try and keep their foot in it and, and head up to the kinks of, of eight and nine there. So that can cause problems to Took a few laps at it to get the hang of it here. And I, I was surprised I felt like I was turning right a lot. The, the, the first <laughs> one and two is a right-hander. And then the, the keyhole is a right-hander. Then there's that big sweeping right-hander at the end. A lot of right-hand corners that there's that 90 degree right-hander as well. It yeah, felt like I, I was on like a, like a, what do they call that? A Mobius strip that somehow I was doing right-hander <laughs> still made it around. Well, it's a good thing that they don't have any pit stops out here because I guess uh, it would be very obvious uh, if you had enough time for two tires, yeah. which ones to take. So it's just going to be straight through today as we watch John White and uh, he's done for the day and qualifying's done. Let's give you the front row. It's Robert Hartley and Gene Fittis. Travis Wallace has a win. He's going to be inside of Joey Boulafay. David Paton and Mike Dam, another winner, make up fifth and sixth. Andres Bertoni and Otto Flitzler, seventh and eighth. Row five is Hirono... Okay, let's do this one. Hironomi Kobayashi in ninth, and we'll go down to tenth. That's Mars Pierre. Hironori, I think it is. Uh, Kota Miwa starts in 11th with Atsushi Maeda in 12th, and Matt Morris starts P13. George Fike will start in the 14th position. John White will be starting next to him in 15th. Chris Thorman in 16th, and Justin Cady in 17th. Maz Hamarizak in the 18th position is followed by Jason Welch, and then Derek Holland winds up 20th. Go. Blackjack is Harrison Prokoska in the double duck spot. It's Brian Zabelski. Adam McLeod behind him, 24th and 25th. It's going to be Jackson Yard and Bradley Reed. There's your 25 drivers. Good luck to them all as we do round number seven here in the Advanced Mazda Cup. Your points leader sitting on pole. That's that yellow and black machine of Robert Hartley. Still waiting for the number two car. Gene fittest to get out there, always worried. There comes Gene. And just to complicate things, look at this, Bill. They've got a curved start for a bunch of the field uh, because of this standing start. It is curved, at least at this level. There are no banking here, so we're still waiting for everybody to take their spot. I hope you got all your snacks and your drinks ready because this is going to be a fast one. 25 minutes of intense racing here. The advanced Mazda Cup round seven. You can hear those Mazda engines begin to harmonize. You just know what it's time to do. Gather up the chicken steak. Cover me on the cows because the horses are out of the barn. And it is Robert Hartley out in front. He's being chased by Finnis. Finnis able. Oh boy, Finnis gets into him. Hartley's going to lose it and Finnis is going to steal that position. Hartley goes off on the grass. He loses another spot to the second place driver. That's Travis Wallace. Hartley tucks back into third. Rounding out your top five, Joey Boulafay and Mike Dam. We got a little car, a few cars in the mid-pack making contact here in five and six. So far, everybody's got it, but not anymore. Andre Bertoni finds himself turned around, but so far the only victim of these close confines. That when I take that back, we got a big accident happening out of seven. Big one up front. That first incident was a long time coming. The next one involved uh, Eris Fiera. The driver who qualified in 10th position. Oof, Good news I, is everybody's still racing. I'm used to seeing that sort of action in faster cars around here because it's so tight, but I didn't think it would be that much of a melee in the MX-5s. But I'm kind of surprised. I mean, I, I, I definitely put the blame on Fittis for making that contact, but I feel like Hartley should have covered him off off the line because I really would have expected Fittis to try and stick his nose in there in the first corner. Fittis goes a little wide out of two. Hartley with a run on him. Now, Hartley was able to get that spot back from Travis, Travis Wallace during the first lap while all that other chaos was going out a little bit farther. Boulafay, Dam, Paton. Some more stuff going on. Fitzler involved in an incident in corner number one. Matt Morris involved in it as well. Drivers getting used to this place, Joe. Yep, as much as they've driven it in other sims, uh, a lot of times with other sims, 
They use it for hot lapping competitions. Uh, not really known as much for racing around here. And you can kind of see why. But look at the top six. Bill, because of that incident that yep. we saw, there's a huge gap from these top six back to seven. Travis Baton, the last driver in sixth position. He has 5.7 seconds back to Hironi Kobayashi in seventh position. There's your front six, and you won't see Kobayashi. Will you see him at all? There he is, just at the top of your screen coming in. Travis Wallace sets the fastest lap as we go on board with Hartley here, still giving chase to our leader. I have a feeling that Robert's not going to feel too kindly about that contact in the very first corner, especially considering it cost him the lead. That is working lap number three as he heads through uh, down into this, what I'm going to call the keyhole here. It's even more of a 180 degree. It's going to tuck you in as all the way around. Those six cars remained lined to stern. Yeah, that, that last hairpin, I think, is more unique than the other two. Uh, not only uh, does it have that little bit of banking bill and, and it go a little bit more than 180 degrees, it also opens up on the exit. So you really need to get to the power sooner than you'd expect. And uh, Hartley is looking very close. I wonder if we're going to see a dive here into one. He doesn't do it yet, but what is interesting is Travis Wallace doing his best to hang on there. The driver in fourth, Joey Boulafay, Mike Dam and uh, David Patton, the drivers 4th, 5th, and 6th, trying to hang with these guys. I love this racing. It's been so long since we've seen one that isn't so heavily dependent on the draft. So Absolutely. I guess there must be a little draft, right? Uh, just a little bit, not enough to really make a big difference. It's all on how you get off the corner. And we had a, a bit of a side-by-side -side battle between Maida and Thorman. This was back for 10th place down in a turn one. Thorman managed to hold him off, but I think uh, this one is not over because it is still very tight in this train of cars in the mid-pack. Atsushi Mayeda had a cup of coffee in the MX-5 World Tour, racing back there in 11th position right now, looking on the back of Chris Thorman. Justin Caddy, a name we're not familiar with, sitting up there in ninth, right behind a very familiar name, George Fike, sitting in eighth. Yeah, and this is pretty much what I expected. Look at all the cars lying astern. It's going to be a lot like this for most of the race until someone makes an error and we'll see all hell break loose like we did at the start again, uh, where everybody kind of scrambles and tries to make their move. Look at that second pack. The front six continue to race in order. Joey Boulafay in fourth was able to hang close to Travis Wallace. He did not lose contact, so there are six cars all equally spaced about two car lengths apart. A little bit of a side-by-side -side battle between Miwa and Welch. Welch on the inside of seven, but he's got to get the power down. Oh, and look at this. See what I was saying, Bill? Now they've got Hamurzak just behind them trying to take advantage. You, you almost have to, and it's a chain reaction up the inside. Who is that? Prochaska. Wow. I think he just got three spots there. That was some great racing. Can we get a replay from Prochaska's view? That was as advantageous as it gets, Bill. Now, I don't I don't think it was intentional necessarily because he went way shallow and broke super deep. But, he, I mean, you know, take what you can get. He made it work. He gets hammer sack, and then he ducks on the inside. He Then he picks up around Jason Welsh. And after he gets Welsh, then he sits behind Kota Mia. It's like we got Miwa. just the end of it on the replay there. Miwa in 13th now. Prochaska back there in 14th. Here we go. This is a great view. One car, two car, and then off the corner, not quite three. Looking up front, they are still in the same order, but I got to admit that Robert Hartley is peeking and poking on the back of Fittis, trying to find a way around. Wallace watching it. Ulisse, Dam, and Paton. And they're putting a bit of a gap on Wallace now. He's got to start hustling and stay with these guys because he's forming a train behind him as well. Bolufe, Dam, and Paton uh, could start to get desperate, and then they'll really lose touch with those two if they fight each other. Been watching the racing line of the two guys up front. And Hartley is taking a wider entry in than 
than Finnis is. Finnis might actually be protecting the line a little bit, taking a little bit of a shallow entry. Hartley waiting a little while and getting a good drive off. Let's see what type of a line they get here out of this little 180. Nah, pretty similar there. Yeah, but I think that uh, I think you're right in that observation. I think Fittis knows what happened at the start means that he's really got to cover himself off because Hartley's a smart driver. He's not going to come away with that without having learned a thing or two. Ooh, and he's staying close now. This is close enough. That draft you were talking about will bring him in just those few more inches. Partly from what we watched on board there, Bill, I think he's trying to square off the corners because he knows he also needs a run. And and that's the good thing that these hairpins do do around here is that they give you many opportunities to really try and, and do a little bit of a different line and launch yourself off. One of the great features of this 25-minute race is they don't have to wait for pit stops. They're racing right now. Anything that they do right now matters. And Hartley can make this pass and then maybe try to drive away. They continue. Those front six continue to work. Losing a little bit of touch now is David Paton back there in sixth. Yeah, he's got the biggest gap of these top six cars. Uh, so he might wind up, wind, uh, wind up stuck in no man's land. We're already down to 16 minutes left. Now, the good news is, is that the laps are so short, that means at least 16 tries <laughs> that they get to try and make a move. You know, George Fike has been holding on to the back of Kobayashi. And though he's not within attacking distance right now, I would be surprised if we do see something happen between these two. Uh, the three behind them also pretty tight. That's Katie, or Caddy, Thorman, and Maida. Is it Caddy or Katie, Bill? I'm sorry, I'm not, I haven't been there here a while. He's new here for me too, but it looks like a single D. I would say that that would probably be uh, Katie, would be my guess. Oh. We'll go with Katie up there. In, in, in There's a nice battle though. Look at, look at uh, Thorman get right behind him. And Atsushi Mieda watching back there in 11th. Yeah, he's going to want to leave them a mule to ride here because Katie uh, certainly has some pressure from Thorman. These are Blues Brothers. That's a good reference. Go ahead. Uh, perfect, 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 perfect. Nothing going on front on the front six, so we're watching a good battle farther back. Ah, look at how close. And, and this is how frustrating it can get. Uh, with these drivers as we uh, ride on board with Justin there. You get so tantalizingly close, but because the speeds aren't very high, even though you're that close, you can't outbreak anybody. Uh, you gotta be right up next to someone to try and have an overtaking move. How about, Joe, why don't we take a quick moment and pay some bills and talk about Trip and Dries back marker shout out. Do you want to go back and maybe talk about the drivers at the end of the lead lap here? Absolutely. The the first one still on the lead lap is Eris uh, Faria. He is currently back in 21st and kind of on his own. He's got about uh, uh, actually quite a bit of time up to the car head. About seven seconds. Oh, no, not anymore. That was Bradley Reed. We just saw at the side of the track who is now in 21st. So swap those two <laughs> around. He is now the last car in the lead lap. Uh, Brian Zabelski is currently sitting in 19th, uh, way ahead of them as well, about four seconds up the road. He's trying to chase Otto Fritzler in 18th. There's about a two second gap between them. Uh, and then it's another eight, almost nine seconds up to 17th. That's Jason Welch. He's got probably the biggest gap of the back cars here. He's at the tail of a train of cars and includes the likes of McLeod in 16th, Hamrizak in 15th, and Pachaska, who he saw make that great move. He's in the 14th position. And that uh, is mostly going to be our back markers uh, in, uh, here uh, with the, the train finishing up with Miwa and Roba Yard. There you go. And while you did that, there was absolutely no change up front other than the gaps. Let's go take a quick peek up front again. It's still a... Uh 
thin as a head of Hartley with Wallace. But look at this. Now, Wallace beginning to open it up a little bit on Joey Boulafay. Dam and Baton making up the, almost a second train there. Yeah, and credit needs to go to uh, the likes of Baton to re-catch this group. Remember how far back he was. So I thought for sure that he was going to drop off the way that he did before. I guess maybe a little bit of the draft helping him in places. Maybe that's keeping him uh, in tow as he takes a little bit of a peek on the likes of Dan. This is a fun race to watch. His passing is so important. We look at those six. I can just report that Kobayashi and Fight continue to race in order. As do the next three. We watch Caddy and Foreman and Miata. They all race in order. Passing is at a premium. And I'm pretty sure most of the drivers expected it. And that's why I said at the start that I, even though I don't think Hartley is to blame, I do think he should have covered off the inside. If, if I, yep. when I came off the start, I would have been looking to see how close the car behind was. And if I saw that they were within striking distance, I would have chopped them off and, and taken the inside line because, you know, like you said, there, it's so difficult to pass that Fittis knew he had an opportunity. He dove it in there. I don't think he meant to touch him. That's not Fittis' style, but it's, he just had to do it. No. Oh. oh, he was making, trying to make a pass on the inside is, is uh, Thomas yeah. Prochaska. Gets together with, I think, Kota Miwa. Oh, no, it was Roba Yard. Roba Yard got tipped around. It was Miwa to the inside. And then in all of that, I think Prochaska maybe was able to take advantage. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So this was, it was two separate incidents. So the one we was yeah. just watched there was Prochaska in the second incident in the turn one and two. But this was kicked off in the final corner. Absolutely. Go back up front. They continue to race as they were. Hartley still a car length back. And now beginning to get away from Travis Wallace. I think Fittis and Hartley, this might be a... I think Hartley's happy with the pace of Fittis. If they can make this a two-car battle, I think they'd enjoy a two-car battle and not have to worry about Wallace. Oh, that's, a, that's absolutely what they want right now. <laughs> but Fittis has been having a little bit of connection problems yet again. That... Uh, that New Zealand uh, wire seems to never be in the greatest of shape uh, for Jane Fittis, which certainly doesn't help Hartley here because he's got to pick his passes carefully. Hartley is on him. Hartley already has two wins this season. He opened with him. And the other thing is, because this race split, uh, there's a little bit more on the line here with the strength of field being a little bit higher if, if it had been a single split, Bill. So I think when it gets to the end, driver's going to be a little bit anxious, even for single positions. It's 2,700 here today for the average. Ooh, we got a battle uh -oh. in the top group. That's Boulouffet. That's on the outside trying to make a move is Mike Dam, and now he has the preferred line, and he's going to get it done. Move Baton. Dam up into fourth. Oh, Baton smelled blood. And he, again, drivers trying to take advantage as soon as something erupts. But that contact this time did not happen like we saw at the very first corner between our leaders. Bolufe held onto it. That was beautiful on his part. So one of the only passes we've seen so far as Fittis comes Ooh. around the final corner, crosses the start finish We had an accident. Line. We had an accident to Maz from Rizak. And, oh, and this he got started into it with, with himself. Yeah, yeah. Koto Miwa. And what's fun, Koto Miwa, and we can watch Koto. That's probably the more exciting car to watch. As he spins through the grass and comes right out in front of traffic, right in front of Jason Welsh. He does a good job of getting around him. Oh, yeah. God, that was so close that we had a, a second incident. Spins it across Whoa. the track. And Koto initially made the right choice, just didn't... He didn't expect that car to snap the way it did. Koda then takes a toe, sadly. Just under nine minutes of racing to go. It continues to be Fittis and Hartley. They've opened up a 1.2 second lead on Wallace, who races by himself. Now Dam has got around Boulafay and is starting to come on, on the back of Wallace. The hamster, Mike Dam, looking for a podium spot. 
So where did this nickname come from, Bill? Because I haven't heard this one on Dam. Mike the Hamster Dam. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. I, I, I dig that one. But yeah, he is, he's starting to get closer. Oh, but that's not going to help. A little bit of an off coming out of turn two. He can still recover. But yeah, he's really, this is where he wants to try to put that pressure on because uh, Wallace is uh, all by himself at this point with the gap that he's losing to Hartley. So now he can really try to go on the attack. The battle continues for up front. We're going to jump back real quick and look at this battle between Kobe Ashi and Fike. The sheriff continues to work on him. He's lost a little gap now. He was just right on his tail a moment ago. Right on board oh, with Kobe. Gotta go up front. Yep, to the lead. I think there's a pass attempt. It's into turn 12. Usually you don't see that, Bill. There's so little breaking into there, and it didn't quite work. Took a stab at it, baby. Seeing and learning a little bit. What if he was trying to catch him by surprise? Like I said, it's, it's not often that you see attempts made into there, let alone actual successful passes. So Hartley may be trying to think outside the box and catch him unawares. Well, with lap times of about a minute and, and about six and a half to race, he's not going to get that many chances at his favorite passing spot. So now things are going to heat up a little bit. The thing I really wonder about is, is what kind of mentality Hartley is taking into this. Is he letting the red mist come? Is this, is this going to be kind of a, a, a short track over racing thing where he pays him back, gives him that little bit of tip that moves him out of the way? So, I mean, I don't know the approach that Hartley intends to take here. Boy, he likes to win, but he likes to race clean. And I think both these guys trust each other. Another stab underneath. Ooh, and a pass behind them. This time, Dam actually doing Not exactly what Hartley was trying to do. Boy, but the runoff from Wallace has a shaft into one. He's not going to be able to do it. Maybe we can get a quick look at the pass that Dam made because I think nope, it made Let's go to the leaders. Story. Uh, leaders are uh, side oh, by side right They're now. Side by side. And I think he's got it. Them. Now, I think Fittis maybe gave that one up a little bit easily. Let's take a look at the replay. I, I'm curious if he lifted a little early because he had the inside and he could have fought it hard into five and six, Bill, but he didn't. The white car? That's Hartley. And yeah, and then Fittis just kind of just surrenders here. Maybe he realized he was not in the preferred spot. Lived to fight another lap, perhaps. Could have been a little bit of guilt. Could have felt like he perhaps. didn't really... Uh, I mean, he, he had to take the position at the start because it, it looked like Hartley was going to lose it. Uh, uh, lose it to... Was it Wallace behind right. in turn two? But then when that didn't happen, I, I get the feeling... From what that looked like to me, Bill, and this is just speculation, I think Fittis was waiting for Hartley to get that one good run and say, okay, you've, you know, you've got the car there, I'm going to let you have it because uh, because of the move at the start. A lot, of history, a lot of history between these guys, and it's good history. It's good, friendly history. They like racing each other. Good race going back here. Bull of Fay has Wallace in front of him, and Baton has been back in six the whole time. Boy, Wallace is starting to look like he was a cork in the bottle here because he's already dropped back from Dam. And now, like you said, Bolufe is starting to just apply a little bit of pressure. Yeah, Mike Dam is the one driver who's worked his way through. He's gotten around both Bolufe and Wallace and now has time with four minutes to go in and within yelling distance of Fittis here. Staying right on him. Oh, this is a great run, too, coming off the final corner. Let's see if Wallace goes defense. Oh, he turns a little bit early, Bill, but this is this is trying to shut the barn door after the horse has already left. And somehow, oh, wow. wow. How did he run. hold that around the outside? I thought that was Bo Fay's spot there. Lesson learned. They continue to battle. We don't need to go there. I can just report that Kobayashi has opened up quite a bit on Fike. Fike able to do nothing with him. How about a quick touch back into ninth position? Just to check in on Caddy and Thorman and Miata. They continue to race in order. 
Justin is is one of my drives at the race. He started this thing in 17th, Bill, and looking at a top 10. That's a lot of positions gained on a track that's that we've been touting is hard to pass. Let's go to have been going down. Let's go, go to fourth real quick. I think we have a run here from Bulafe down into one. He's going to look to the outside. We saw a move here before. He's going to try it on the outside this time. Cannot do it. That's Wallace in front of him. Bulafe, I think, is faster. Yeah, Joey looked for the over-under, but just couldn't get the power down soon enough. And this is not a long enough straight, really, to have that give you a good effect unless you really outgun the other driver. Just behind them, don't forget Baton. Again, we've seen a lot of drivers really try to snatch up spots as soon as others start to go side by side. And I think that's what David's waiting for. Take a look at the gap of the lead, though. Yep. Yeah. Once hardly got around, it was see you later. I thought I heard yeah. contact there. I, did. I think uh, that looks like an Hammersack. engine blew based on that Hammersack smoke. blew it, yeah. Out of the final corner, car number 24. And then I think he put it right in pit lane. He was racing last car on the lead lap, I believe. That's a shame. Oof, defensive move from Wallace there. It's the battle. The battle for fourth right now. And this is costing them ever more time up to the podium. Mike Dam now will hold two seconds up from this group. Boy, and Patton is back there looking for a way around. This is some good racing for the minute I have to go. Oh, a bad exit out of that corner from Bulafe. I thought Patton might be able to get a run. Yeah, he got a little greedy. It's so easy to do that in these hairpins. I found the car liked to understeer quite a bit around them in these slow speeds. And Joey just pressed the gas way too soon. Looks like Bob Hartley's going to be able to take the white flag. He's got a lapped car in front of him of Bradley Reed, but I don't think he's going to catch Reed in time. White flag, one to go for Robert Hartley, looking to pick up his third win. I'm really surprised we haven't seen more traffic come into play uh, around this short circuit. But I think because we had so many cars have a problem on the first lap with damage, uh, that took away many of the back members. Hartley now down into the second 180. I think he actually may be able to catch the back of Bradley Reed here. We'll see what Reed does. Once the leaders cross the line, we're going to jump back to that battle for fourth between Wallace and Bulafe and Patton because that's heating up. Let's keep an eye, though, on Hartley as he works on the back. Now, this is always scary of Bradley Reed. I'll tell you right now, Bradley wants to finish on the Reed. He's going to pull over. There's some good sportsmanship. And this is Coming our finish. Up. Coming out of the final corner now, it is Robert Hartley. He sees the checkered flag. Let's give round number seven of the advanced monster cup to Robert Hartley. Let's go back to fourth position. Travis Wallace is going to be able to hold off Boulafe. Baton settles for sixth. Kobayashi beats Fike. I think, watch this, it's going to be fun out of here. Fike doing everything he can, Joe. Could not get it done. No, but still, eighth place. Uh, not bad, because Fike also started in 14th, so he gained a lot of spots here by staying out of trouble. Looking at 13th position. They're all going to come across Caddy, Miata, and, and uh, Thorman. I think Miata was able to get around Thorman, so he, he picks up that spot to get a top 10. All right, There's everyone. A battle for uh, last place on the oh, lead lap here. Zabelski looking on Eris, just shy, less than a car length. Oh, let's move that start finish line down another couple hundred feet, could <laughs> we? All right, the racing is over here in Japan, but our broadcast is far from done. We'll take a short break, but we will be back to run down the entire finishing order. Talk to some of the drivers before we put a lock on the gate. Don't go far.
This is the Global Sim Racing Channel's coverage of the Advanced Mazda Cup Round 7. Let's talk a little bit about iRacing. For a decade, they've been of the vanguard of esports racing, and if you haven't done so yet, you can join the iRacing community and compete online against thousands of players in the world's most realistic racing simulation. The best of the best in iRacing's World Championship, as well as many private leagues like the one you're watching right now, are showcased right here on the iRacing Esports Network. GSRC is proud to be part of the IESN stable of broadcasters. Let's give you the finishing order here for round seven. He started on the pole, lost the lead in the first corner, worked his way back up, got around Gene Finnis, and picks up his third win of the season. We're talking about Robert Hartley, our points leader. Gene Finnis set it for second. Mike Dam made a nice run through the field, started in sixth, picked up three spots to get that final podium spot. Travis Wallace, Joey Boulafay, and David Patton go fourth, fifth, and sixth. A battle for seventh between Hironi Kobayashi and Jordi Fike finishes in that order as the Sheriff was not able to pick up a spot. Justin Caddy hangs on to ninth, but Atsushi Baida does pick up the 10th position. Joe? Chris Thorman is going to take 11th, and how about this from Adam McLeod, 23rd to 12th. Uh, Jason Welch as well climbed up the order from 19th to 13th, and Harrison Prochaska had a really good move early on, but uh, was not without his issues. He still gets a 14th place. Jackson Robillard comes home in P15 with Eris Faria uh, finishing 16th, and Brian Zavelski finishes P17. Then it's Bradley Reed coming home first car a lap down in 18th, Thomas uh, Hamrazak in 19th, and Matt Morris finishing in 20th. In Blackjack, it's Kotomiwa, John White in the double duck spot. Derek Holland comes home 23rd, right behind him, Otto Flitzler. And then it's Andres Bertoni in the final quarter century mark. Okay, there's your 25 finishers there, and let's go ahead and do interviews now as we're able to talk to the driver who finished in second. That would be Gene Fittis, the New Zealand driver. We'll bring him down here in just a minute, give him a yell. Now we got Gene here. Gene, you had the lead for a while, picked it up in the first corner, then did you didn't fight that hard when, when Hartley was alongside you. Uh, hi, Soup. Hi, everyone in the booth. Uh, that's exactly right. Um, I gave Rob a pretty good uh, touch-up in turn one there, so when he um, got the nose alongside, I kind of just gave it up, you know, um, considering the way I'd uh, gained the lead earlier in the race. My partner Joe Peak had that one nailed. He said, you know, that felt like a little bit of a little bit of a apology on your part. Nevertheless, a second place finish. Tell us a little bit about this track. It's fun to watch. Is it fun to drive? It's very fun to drive. Uh, maybe not so much if you're behind people that you want to get by. It's incredibly hard to pass here. It can be half a second or more uh, faster than someone and still really struggle to get by, um, you know, in a clean fashion. Correct me if I'm wrong on this one. It looked like the line you were taking when Hartley was behind you. I guess Hartley had the the opportunity to take that wider entry. Were you taking a little shallow or take that inside mark, or was that just your normal racing line? Um, I, actually, I felt like I was uh, coming into the corners kind of, uh, from out wide <laughs> and um, kind of parking it on the apex a little bit, if possible, and just checking him up so he couldn't get a run coming out of the straights. But... Um, having said that, I was always in the back of my mind, um, uh, you know, thinking about that turn one touch up and, um, was never going to fight it too hard if he did get alongside. So, um, I'll get you, yeah. I'll get you out of here on this one. He made a couple stabs on you know, that final corner, that final sweeping right-hander. That was a bit of a surprise for us, but then were you surprised that he got alongside you where he did? Um, no, because I knew exactly how much uh, wheel spin I'd had coming out of that corner. So when he uh, got the nose alongside, I wasn't too surprised at all, to be honest. The writing was on the wall. Hey, congratulations for the second place finish. That's going to be good points. It's a strong strength of field. That'll move you up the charts. Way to go. Thanks very much. Hey, have I got a minute just to say a couple sure. of thank yous to some people? Ah, oh, cheers. Yeah. Um, I just want to say a big g'day to all the geodesic guys that are camped out on the infield at Daytona right now for the 24-hour. And uh, hi to all their families back home. And uh, we actually had a pretty uh, awesome announcement um, just in the lead up to the iRacing Daytona 24 hour. And um, we're very happy and excited to have Alpine Stars on board now as our major title sponsor. And um, they've recognized 
you know, the value of sim racing and esports and have opened the door up to, to guys like us and, and potentially many others as well, which is a really awesome thing for sim racing as far as I'm concerned. And uh, so a big shout out to Alpine Stars, uh, ATK PLN is another new sponsor we got on board as well. And of course, uh, similar Cube Controls and Mike at In Principle Games. Um, we just want to thank them all very much for the support of our team. And uh, hi to my family back home. And uh, yeah, that'll do it. Thanks a lot, Sue. There you go. You guys are always welcome to get those plugs in. Another way that uh, simulation racing mimics real world racing. Got to get in those sponsor plugs. Joe, who you got? I got Travis Wallace here who managed to finish fourth today just off the podium. And Travis, I'm curious because we were wondering how powerful the draft was. And it, it seemed like the first half of the race you were managing to stay with both Fittis and Hartley. Would, would you attribute that to the slipstream or, or did you lose pace due to something else? Oh, looks like uh, waiting Travis to get mic'd up. Looks like he's got himself muted right now. So we'll give Travis a second to try and get uh, his mic working. Looks like we might got get something here. Travis, you have a copy? Yeah, yeah, I got you now. Had to, had to work out the kinks. <laughs> uh, did you hear my question? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, it's okay. <laughs> So it, it seemed like maybe the slipstream was was helping you stay with the top two at the start, or is or is that a bad assessment? Was there another reason that you fell off partway through the race? Uh, no, the uh, the slipstream down the backstretch definitely helped. Uh, my major weakness was that final corner. I especially about halfway through, I think I just got the the left side tires too hot and I couldn't hold the line that I wanted to. So uh, after you fell off, suddenly you had Mike Dam working on you. We we asked Gene about uh, the surprise of Hartley trying to make a pass into turn 12. Uh, what about you? Were you a bit surprised to see drivers try to make a go into that fast right sweeper at the end of the course? Uh, no, not at all. It's, uh, it's, it's high speed. It's a great passing opportunity. Uh, I mean, you carry a lot of momentum in there, so you got to you got to make sure that you're going to hit the inside if you want to make a move on somebody. But, uh, no, nah, when I seen it was Mike Dan behind me, I, I know he's faster. Uh, I basically just didn't want to lose time to the leaders and let the guys behind us catch up. I seen that he had pulled a gap. Uh, I just wanted it to be clean and quick and get back on the racing line. So I, I voiced him in the, in the chat there and told him just to go ahead. I wasn't going to fight him. <laughs> <laughs> Very polite racing on your part. So, this is a, obviously a newer circuit here on iRacing, but very short compared to a lot of the schedule here in the Advanced MX-5 Cup. Would you like to see more short tracks like this that are almost bullring-like uh, to, to race on, or do you prefer the, the long ones that give a lot of drafting opportunities? Uh, both of them give great racing. Uh, I mean, like you said, man, the tracks like Spa and stuff that started off the season, the, the draft, and it keeps everybody in a pack. But I think I enjoy the the short ones like this more. It's it's more physical. Luckily, we didn't get in any trouble. Uh, but it, it's you more guys physical. didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking just for me there. Uh, but yeah, it's it's physical racing. It stays close. It uh, it's hard to pass. I'd say would be the only downside to here. But uh, it it gives great racing. Well, the upside to the difficulty in passing is it gave us a lot of tense moments out there. Congratulations on a fourth, and we hope to see you in a week's time. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. That's uh, Travis Wallace, the Carolina driver, taking home fourth. Bill? That's going to do it for us. We'd like to thank everybody at the Advanced Mazda Cup community, especially the sheriff, Jordy Fike for supporting this broadcast, and of course, the good guys at Reekmotech. On screen now are just some of the equipment and software used to stream cyberspace into your place. The original music that lets your ears alert your eyes you're watching a GSRC production comes courtesy of Eric Eckholm and Jules Lalon. See the screen to have to contact each of them. Hey, the Advanced Monster Cup returns next week for round eight. We're going to stay in Japan, a 25-minute no-pit-stop sprint from Suzuka. GSRC via IESN will be there to bring you all the action. We hope you join us. The next IESN broadcast is in just a few hours, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. That's the Formula 3.5 Championship, Round 7 from Road Atlanta. Don't want to miss that. Hey, and don't forget about GSRC's coverage of the Grand Prix Legends. From That's going to be Round 7 from Donington Park. Tomorrow, my partner Joe Peek is going to be there with Johan Vanderbilt calling all the action. 
That's going to be live Saturday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Sliding across your screen now are just some of the upcoming GSRC broadcasts, so check those out and mark them down on your calendar. If you'd like more information about GSRC, you got lots of options. How about you visit GlobalSimRacingChannel.com or check us out on social media, Twitter at GSR Channel, Facebook at Global Sim Racing Channel, and Instagram at GSRC underscore Gram. Also, if you haven't done so yet, become a YouTube subscriber by heading over to our YouTube page and hitting that big red button. Finally, on behalf of the entire crew, Joe, Sean, and Dougie, like to thank all of you for watching as Robert Hartley gets his third season win here at Sakuba. With that said, we're off to have fun storming the castle. So until next time, race clean, race hard, and we'll see you on the track.